Would you take the Word of God and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts and uh, chapter 24. Acts and uh, chapter 24. We've looked at this recently on Sunday mornings with our series through the book of Acts, but here Paul is appearing before Governor Felix after the Jews had accused Paul of committing sedition against Rome, of uh, blaspheming against the temple, and he speaks as a man, uh, given the opportunity by Governor Felix, he speaks as a man who has been falsely accused, he speaks as a man who is in bonds. And so how is Paul able to find comfort in this predicament? How can Paul be at peace during those difficult times? And we find here that really his comfort, and this is a general statement from the Scriptures, that really comfort is found both in the Holy Ghost, but also peace is found in part, we've learned this in this series, Peace is found in part in the testimony of the conscience. And Paul brings that up as he stands before uh, Governor Felix. And so we're going to begin here reading in Acts 24, uh, verse 10. We'll look a little bit at the context of what Paul is saying. Acts 24, verse 10, the Word of God says, Then Paul, after that, he, at, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, for as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward men. I'd like to bring your attention to that expression where Paul says, I exercise myself, I exercise myself to have always a conscience that is uh, void of offense toward God and toward men. I would like to preach this evening on this subject, exercising to have always a conscience void of offense. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. I pray that you would give us, as we conclude this series with uh, this message this evening, that we would uh, truly receive the understanding that we need from this series to help us to be able to declare as Paul that we are exercising ourselves to always have a conscience that is void of offense. Help us, Lord, to learn what that means and to cultivate in our lives a conscience void of offense. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we begin to consider what it means to exercise ourselves to have always a conscience that is void of offense, uh, let me ask some questions, and I'm going to ask those questions as we look back at the series, and it'll be, a, in a sense, a summary of the series before we make the application of where we're going this evening, but the, these questions will be helpful as we uh, conclude. What is it that the conscience does? What is it that the conscience does? We're going to ask that question. Then, what is the state of the conscience? And when I say that is, we have to ask ourselves, we know that the conscience is in various states or conditions, and what is the state of the conscience and how does it get there? Uh, what is the, the negative state of the conscience, but then also the positive state of the conscience? And I say negative and positive because the conscience has a positive work, but it also has a negative work. And we tend to think of the conscience in 
uh, in negative terms as to what it does, but the majority of the time that Paul refers to the conscience and how it stands with him, he refers to the positive side of the work of the conscience. And so let's begin with that first question, what does the conscience do? Again, this will be a summary of the series, but let's talk about here what it does. We know from the scriptures, first of all, based on John chapter 8, that the conscience convicts. That's what it does. Uh, in John chapter 8, we refer to that account a number of times, but a woman was caught in the act of adultery. The religious leaders brought the woman to Jesus Christ. They said that Moses and the law says that she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now that's me briefly summarized. We know that more than that happened. But he said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And the Bible says that uh, they left from the oldest to the youngest. The Bible says being convicted, convicted by their own conscience. So what we learn here is what the conscience does. What does it do? It convicts. It convicts man. And so the idea there of the word convict means it, it convinces a man that he is in the wrong. Uh, it tells a man his faults. We might put it that way. Uh, it rebukes and reproves. That's what the word really convict means. It means to reprove and to rebuke. And so that's what the conscience does. It reproves us. Now it's part of us, <laughs> but it reproves us. It acts in a sense independent of us. It convicts, it reproves, it re, uh, rebukes us. Now, let me make those statements uh, in a preliminary way. We know what outs reproves and rebukes. Well, let me put it this way. John 16, 8, the Bible says that when He, the Holy Ghost, has come, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So it's interesting that... The conscience convicts, it reproves and rebukes, but it's also what the Holy Spirit does. He also reproves. We also know, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Interesting. So the Holy Ghost, He reproves. The Scriptures are good because they reprove us. And we know that... Paul instructed Timothy to preach the word. He says, be instant in season, out of season. And then he says, reprove. And so preaching, scriptures, and the Holy Ghost all are involved in reproving. And it is interesting to know that one of the ways that the conscience works is that it reproves. It rebukes. It convicts. So that is what the conscience does. The conscience is at its best condition when it works in agreement with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Scriptures, and the preaching of the Word. Uh, that's when the conscience does its best work. When it does exactly what the Holy Ghost does, what the Word does, and what the preaching of the Word does. But there's two more things that it does. It also, as we see uh, really throughout the series, it bears witness. Now, the rebuking part or the convicting part, we might say that's the negative work of the conscience. But the conscience also has a positive work. And Paul refers to the conscience bearing witness, bearing him witness. And so in this sense, the conscience is an internal witness that we know based on Romans 2, can either accuse us or excuse our behavior. Uh, these are through thoughts. The exam really are thoughts and our intentions. And so the expression to bear witness, that the conscience bears witness, means that uh, the word bears witness means to testify jointly. That's why he said, uh, bears witness with me. And so it testifies with me. Uh, it means to corroborate. It, it means to give evidence of. And so uh, Paul, often he refers to the conscience and says, I am acting in this way, or I'm doing this, or I'm saying this, and my conscience is bearing witness. My conscience is testifying with me. 
It has joined me along in agreement with me. It is corroborating what I'm saying, that it is the truth. And so the conscience is part of us, but again it acts independent of us and that it bears witness with ourselves. But also, we could say another word is it testifies as well, which is closely aligned to bearing witness, but uh, the, uh, the idea of that it testifies, it acts as evidence. Uh, so the conscience has both a positive and a negative work. It stands either, we might summarize it this way, that the conscience either stands against us or it stands with us. That's what it does. So that's what the conscience does. But let's talk secondly about what is the negative state of the conscience. So we know what it does, and the Bible refers to the different conditions of the conscience. And therefore, if we examine the conditions of the conscience, we have to say this, that when it is found in a negative state, then what the conscience is supposed to be doing, it doesn't do anymore. And when it is in a good state, that the conscience fulfills its role. Now, let's look at what is the negative state of the conscience. Now, we talked about how the conscience can be seared, it can be weak, it can be defiled, and the Bible speaks of an evil conscience. Now, both will talk about both the negative and the positive state of the conscience, and they both have to be understood in light of what the conscience does. Now, when we talked about the evil conscience, we went primarily to Roman or to Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. I preached a message on that. Uh, an evil conscience is the condition of the conscience when a man is in an unregenerate state, where he, when he is not saved. He is declared to have an evil conscience. Only salvation can do away with an evil conscience. And that's what Hebrews 9 and 10 emphasizes. And so if any man be in Christ, the Bible says, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And that means, since the conscience is part of us, that there is a new conscience. The Bible says that the evil conscience has been purged. It's been cleansed. That's what happens. So that's the condition. The evil conscience is when the condition is in that state. It is in the state when a man is unregenerate. He is not saved. He has an evil conscience. Now, let's deal with the seared conscience, the weak conscience, and the defiled conscience. Let's begin with the seared conscience. This is a state where the conscience can be in. And the seared conscience, this is when the conscience we might say, is no longer sensitive. Uh, the conscience uh, has been hardened. That's why he uses the expression, it uh, seared with a hot iron. It has become calloused. Uh, I used that illustration already. Uh, they, uh, for example, they used to brand cattle uh, by, uh, you know, putting maybe letters or numbers on hot metal and warm up the metal, and then they would press that uh, hot metal against the hair and the skin of the cattle and then that cattle would be branded the skin melts and then they remove that and then the skin hardens and at that spot the cow has no longer any feeling he is branded he has been seared with a hot iron he loses sensitivity in that area the sensitivity that ought to be there has been burned it's been seared with a hot iron so, if we know what the conscience does, what does it do? It convicts, it reproves, it bears witness, it testifies. So, when the Bible says that the conscience is seared, that means that the conscience no longer convicts. It no longer, it has been hardened. And so, in this case, the conscience no longer convicts, it no longer bears witness. We might put it this way, that the conscience has become silent. When the conscience is seared, it means that the conscience has been silenced. The sensitivities that ought to be there are no longer there. All right? What about the weak conscience? Well, when we looked at the weak conscience, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and then chapter 10, this is when the conscience is too sensitive. <laughs> or 
we might say sensitive at the wrong things. That's the weak conscience. Uh, in this case, the conscience has been elevated to being a guide. Now, the reason why I say this, because I've said throughout the series, is we understand that the conscience is not to be a guiding principle. The conscience does not govern our lives. Uh, God's Word and the indwelling Holy Spirit is our guide, is what governs our lives. And so the conscience should not, should never be a guiding principle. Um, it is a rather a regulating principle. That's what the conscience is. It is not a guiding principle or a governing principle. It is a regulating principle. And so the conscience does not, we might put it this way, the conscience does not make the rules. It lets us know we have broken the rules. Do we understand the difference? Okay, God makes the rules. <laughs> and every once in a while the conscience comes alongside and says, you've broken the rules. So it's important now, in that case, when the conscience is weak, it's clear from the scriptures that the conscience has become the guiding principle in the person's life. And when the conscience has become the guiding principle, then people often become too sensitive at things they ought not to be sensitive. And we know that they can do away with that by what? By a knowledge of the truth. And we find that those who were weak, had a weak conscience, are those who were not knowledgeable in the scriptures. And so they were offended at things that they ought, ought not to be offended at. They had a consciousness or a sensitivity that ought not to be there. So there is a seared conscience, a weak conscience. A seared conscience, the conscience is silent. It doesn't do the work it's supposed to do. When it's a weak conscience, it is too sensitive. It's too involved. It becomes a dominating, dominating principle in somebody's life. But then there is the defiled conscience. Now, the defiled conscience is what happens because of a weak conscience. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 8 tells us. Now, the defiled conscience, this is when the conscience is contaminated or confused. Uh, the, word that, the word defiled uh, literally means to sully, to taint, to contaminate. And so this happens when the conscience is weak, the conscience becomes defiled. Uh, and so in this case, the conscience is contaminated, and therefore it does not render proper, uh, proper judgment. It, it, uh, it may condemn when it should not, and it may commend when it should not. That's a defiled conscience. By the way, we might say that those who are unregenerate, uh, those in the world have a defiled conscience because they applaud things they should not applaud and they condemn things that they ought to condemn. That is a defiled conscience and it is possible, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, for a, for a, a believer, a Christian, to have a defiled conscience. So the conscience can be seared, it can be weak, it can be defiled. And we talked about the evil conscience, the state of unregenerate man. So these are the, the negative states or conditions of the conscience. There are positive conditions for the conscience. What are the positive states of the conscience? Well, first of all, the Bible talks about how there is a good conscience. Now, a good conscience, we might say, is a conscience that's working like it ought to work. That's a good conscience. It, and by the way, because what we understand, what, what does it do? It, it convicts. It bears witness, and it testifies. That is a good conscience. Uh, in other words, let me put it this way. When the conscience convicts us and says, hey, you're guilty, you ought not to have done that, you ought not to have said that that way, and our conscience condemns us, we ought to say, thank you, because it does what it's supposed to do. And that's a good conscience. A good conscience. The Bible also speaks of a pure conscience. And by the way, we might say that a pure conscience, the opposite to that would be a defiled conscience. A conscience that has been sullied, that has been contaminated. A pure conscience means that it has not been contaminated. And so we might say that a pure conscience is a conscience that is free from defilement. A pure conscience is a conscience that operates, we might put it this way, that operates within the boundaries of God's Word. But also, in our text, 
We have a conscience that is void of offense. A conscience that is void of offense. Um, <clears throat> if the conscience says you have offended, then your conscience is not void of offense. And so it stands, when a conscience is void of offense, that means that the conscience stands not as a witness against us, but it stands as a witness with us. Now, this is our text here. Because people have uh, lied about the Apostle Paul. They've said things that are not true about the Apostle Paul. By the way, he gives a good case here in court of saying, I've done nothing wrong. There's no witnesses. And he presents his case, but he basically brings in the witness of the conscience. And he says, look, God knows, men know that I've done absolutely nothing wrong. And I always exercise myself uh, to have a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward man. He's not saying here that the conscience is not convicting him, is not working. No, the conscience is working, but it's standing with him, not against him. It's doing a positive work. Now, by the way, the fruit of a good conscience is peace. Peace. That's the fruit of a good conscience. Peace. We'll look at that in just a moment. So, we know what the conscience does. We must be aware also of the various states that the condition is in. Paul in our text says, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So let me just, let's just take those verses, see what Paul is saying here, and then try to build a case as to how we can cultivate a conscience that is void of offense. What is Paul saying when he says that, herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward men? Here is what happens first. First, we must establish a goal. We must establish a goal. What's the goal here? Well, the goal for Paul, the goal that he was pursuing, you might say the prize that he was trying to attain to was what? A conscience that was void of offense toward God and toward men. And so he wanted his conscience to be void of offense. And so um, here Paul says, I have a clear goal. And if we are going to have a conscience void of offense, we have to have a clear goal that that's what we want. Because if we don't make that a goal in our lives, you're not going to reach what you're not aiming for. Paul says, that's what I'm aiming for. I want to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. That is my goal. And so Paul desired to act in such a way that his conduct should not be displeasing to God or injurious to man. He wanted to have, that was his goal. That's what he wanted to be accepted in the sight of God. So we must establish the goal. The goal is to have a conscience void of offense. But then secondly, we must be purposeful towards the goal. So Paul says, here's my goal. I want to have a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward man. Now, because that's the goal, we have to be purposeful towards the goal. And so here's what Paul says. Herein, do I exercise myself? So I have a goal, but now I am purposeful concerning the goal. So we have to have a clear goal, but then exercise means that we have to be purposeful. The word here, exercise, means this, to train. It means to, to strive for something. It's a, a term that was used, that Paul often uses in, in uh, his writings where he talks about uh, let us run the race that is set before us. And so he likens the living the Christian life to a race, but here he brings in the exercising, the training. And so here he says, this is my constant aim. This is the goal that I am actually actively, purposefully striving for. And so what he is saying here, just like an athlete does not train just to run a race, rather... The athlete trains to finish the race and to win the prize. And so if that's the goal, 
then the athlete, according to the goal, which is to win the prize and to finish the race, not just to run it. You've seen athletes through the years maybe run at the Olympics and someone will get injured. They'll fall. They'll fall short. They won't cross the line. Guess what? They'll limp through the line. And often you'll hear athletes say, my country didn't send me to run the race. They sent me to finish the race. Why? That's the mentality of the athlete. The goal is to finish. And so if the goal is to have a conscience void of offense, then there has to be a purposefulness in exercising towards that goal. And so the conscience that is void of offense, we're saying, is, does not happen by accident. The psalmist said this in Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The goal was what? I don't want to sin against God. So here's what I have to do. I have to hide God's word in my heart. So the goal, I want to please God. I want to have a conscience void of offense. So I'm going to exercise myself. I'm going to train. I'm going to strive for. I'm going to be purposeful to reach that goal. But there's another thing about this goal. Not only do we have to establish a goal, we have to be purposeful towards the goal. But thirdly, we must be consistent in pursuit of the goal. Now, notice the word he uses. He says, herein do I exercise myself to have always. So we must be consistent in pursuit of the goal. Uh, the word always means through all time, constantly, continually. That's what the word means. Here, here's what it means. We have the goal, we're going to exercise ourselves, and we have to be unrelenting in the pursuit of that goal. Now, the athletes, they, uh, they'll train and they take breaks. Part of uh, the training is to have the body recover. So in that sense, uh, we're not talking here, we are not talking about a physical training, we're talking about spiritual training. But there is no pause in that spiritual training. To have a conscience that is void of offense is something that we have to exercise ourselves, but not only do we have to exercise ourselves and be purposeful about it, but we have to be always purposeful about it. Paul standing, being able to have comfort and peace in this moment where he is falsely accused, where he is dealing with people who are lying against him, who is dealing with bonds that he does not deserve, says, I have a conscience. What I can be at peace because I always exercise myself to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. So how do we cultivate a good conscience? Let me give you the point. And this, this is simple, but hopefully it will help us. Here is the first thing. First of all, you must be saved. You will never have a good conscience toward God unless you're a Christian. We read that in Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. There must be, as the Bible puts it, there must be the purging of an evil conscience. It has to happen. You will not have a conscience void of offense unless you are a born-again Christian, unless all things are become new. And we talked about last week how uh, Paul says, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. What Paul is simply saying is that my conscience has been enlightened. You remember before he was saved, he used to persecute the Christians and he thought he was doing God a service. He thought he was doing right and he was doing wrong. But now his conscience has been enlightened. And now he says, I'm uh, saying that my conscience is clear, it's clean, because it's been uh, illuminated, it's been influenced by the Spirit of God. And so you have to be saved. But here is what we must do to cultivate a good conscience as Christians. Here, secondly, you must yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and submit yourself to the authority of God's Word. Now that is so basic, but at the same time, 
we know that the, that is exactly where the issue is in our lives. And I'll say that, I know that that's where the issue is in my life. We must yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and submit to the authority of God's Word. Remember, what is the governing principle in our lives? It's God's Word and the Holy Spirit. John 15 says the Holy Spirit, He will guide you into all truth. The Bible says that the Word of God gives us all that we need for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so the Holy Spirit and the Word of God must become the governing principles in our lives. In other words, the conscience needs guidance. It needs guidance. It doesn't make the rules. It regulates the rules. And so these two are always found, by the way, the Holy Spirit and the Word, they are always found in agreement. You must decide, we must decide that the Scriptures will be our guide, period. And we can't debate about it. We just can't. Can't do it. This is the place, by the way, that is the place where the conscience is illuminated. The conscience left to itself is evil. It can be seared, weak, and defiled. It has to be illuminated. How is it illuminated? By the Word and by the Spirit of God. It's um, interesting that when we think about the Holy Spirit and the Word and the preaching of the Word, all three of those do the same type of work that the conscience does. The conscience convicts, it reproves, well, that's what the Holy Ghost does. That's what the Word does. That's what the preaching of the Word ought to do. So here's what happens is, how do we cultivate a good conscience? We submit to the Spirit of God when He speaks to us. We submit to the authority of God's Word. When the Word of God is preached and taught, we submit to it and we say, this is going to be the governing principle in my life. And what that does is it guides the conscience in the right direction. So now the things that we learn from the Word that we might not have been sensitive to before, now we become sensitive to those things. Not because we come up with the sensitivity, but because God's Word has guided us, has illumined us, and has directed our conscience to be to regulate us where we ought to be regulated. And so, we must yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and submit to the authority of God's Word. That's how we can have a good conscience. Thirdly, we must purposefully be still and commune with our own heart. We must examine our actions, our speech, and our motives. Uh, turn with me to uh, Psalm, Psalm 4. <clears throat> Psalm 4. So that's a, is that really how we can cultivate a good conscience? Well, let me show you what the Bible says here. We must purposely be still and commune with our own hearts, our actions, our speech, our motives. Notice Psalm 4, verse 4. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. That is something that we do not do very well. Let me put forth a scenario for you. You get up in the morning, eat your breakfast, get ready, put your clothes on, uh, Whatever you do in the morning, get to work, you work all day, you come back, dinner time, and then if you have children, while well, you're busy all evening, and it's noisy, and it might be sometimes you say, well, uh, or you turn to different types of entertainment, and the point is from the moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night, there's not one opportunity, not one opportunity for you to be still to be still. Now, I grew up, my dad always taught me, idleness is the devil's workshop. Get busy. And I understand that. It's good to work hard. But the Bible also says it's important to be still. Why? Because when we are still, we can commune with our own heart. 
And here he says, upon your bed and be still. Every once in a while it's good to stop. Why? Because guess what? When does the conscience work in us? When we are still. When we come to church. We're not doing anything else and we ought to be focused on the Word and uh, uh, the Word of God speaks to our hearts. Or maybe we might open the Bible in the morning and have a personal devotion. That's a time when we are still and God can speak to our hearts. But here he says, let me commune with my own heart upon my bed. Notice later in verse 7 and 8 he says, Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell and save Now, the context is he's facing enemies. And it, isn't it interesting that in Psalm 4, as he's dealing with enemies all about, he's not asking God, Hey, God, would you please remove all my enemies? He says, no, I'm going to be still, and I'm going to commune with my own heart. Here's what happens. We can be distracted by the outside enemy and fail to commune with our own hearts and just be still. We see the problem with everybody else around us and we fail to see the problems in our own hearts. The peace that he experiences at the end of the psalm is the result of him standing still and communing with his own heart. We read that in Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I came across this quote by, uh, quote by George Herbert, and here's what he said. He said, Sum up at night what thou hast done by day, and in the morning what thou hast to do. Dress and undress thy soul. Make, uh, mark the decay or the growth of it. You see, we have to be intentional about the condition of our hearts. You see, we can be so busy, 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 even serving God. And we have to ask ourselves, well, does your conscience ever bother you? And you might say, well, I don't have time to be bothered by my conscience. When does that happen? In stillness. And that must be done purposefully. There is one more thing we find. So, you must be saved. You must yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and submit yourself to the authority of God's Word. You must properly be still and commune with your own heart. Examine your action, your speech, your motives. By the way, if that's your heart, as the psalmist, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way to me. Do you think that there's any, if there's anything and you stop do you think that God's going to ignore you at that moment? No, He's going to say exactly the things in your life that need to be cared for, that need to be tended to. There's one more thing. Fourth, we must confess our sins to God, thereby training the conscience to be sensitive to what is right and wrong. Let me say that again. We must confess our sins to God, thereby training the conscience to be sensitive to what is right and wrong. The conscience is the sensitive part of man. You remember the conscience can be seared. It can become without feeling. It can stop its work. So if we are to exercise ourselves to have always a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward man, what better way is there for us to train the conscience than to confess our sins to God? You know what confess means? It means to say the same thing. God says, don't lie, I've lied. I'm going to say what it is. I've lied. I've stolen. I was angry. Whatever it is, you confess that to God. And when you're doing that actively and purposely, you know what happens to your conscience? Your conscience says, oh, here's the sensitivity that ought to be in my life. You know why that's important? Let me give you an example. If I become angry and I fly in a rage, and the conscience says, ah, that's really not appropriate behavior. 
and I move on with my life ignoring and just stay busy. Next time I become angry, the conscience will say, hey, that ought not to be done. And I ignore it and move on with my life and refuse to be still. But uh, sometimes uh, just you try to get busy so that you can silence the conscience purposefully. You don't want to live with yourself or sit with yourself or go to bed at night with yourself. And so you don't, and every once in a while, as, as that happens, the, the conscience will, will lose its sensitivity and its feeling. And your conscience can become seared. But see, if you do the opposite and you become angry, and then uh, maybe later in the day, uh, the Lord says, hey, that, the conscience says that was not appropriate behavior. And then you find yourself to go in a place and you say, God, I, I've been angry and I've been convicted about my anger. And God, I need you to forgive me because I was wrong. I've sinned against you. Would you forgive me? What happens at that very moment, not only do you get forgiveness of sins at that moment by confessing it, but your conscience is awakened to the sensitivity. And the next time your conscience, because you confessed that, it is trained and awaken the conscience. The conscience has been guided now in the right direction to know that the next time it might be that before you become angry, your conscience says that is not right and you will be more sensitive about your sin when you confess it than when you ignore it. You say you must confess your sins to God, thereby training the conscience to be sensitive to what is right and wrong. You know what Proverbs 8.15 says? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Your own understanding. Proverbs 14.12 There is a way which seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. You see we all have our lives how we conduct our lives and there are things that we, ah, I'm, I, I'm right, I, I, I am good. I, I'm trying to, and I don't know if I'm doing a good job. But we have to cultivate a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward man. Always. We have to set the goal. The goal is we, we want to have that, and, and as I've said throughout this series, a conscience that is void of offense is at peace. At peace. You will not find peace in your life by pursuing peace. You will find peace by exercising yourself to have a conscience void of offense. Set that goal. Purposefully pursue that goal and be consistent about it. And then you can say as Paul, I do always exercise myself to have a conscience that is void of offense toward God and toward me.